CompTIA A+, Core 2, Complete Training Course. Exam Objective 1.6, Given a Scenario, Configure Microsoft Windows Networking Features on a Client Desktop. Client Network Configuration. CompTIA A+, Core 1, is where networking is discussed in detail, but Core 2 has us covering various networking elements, including IP addressing schemes, static versus dynamic addressing, subnet masks, default gateways, and DNS settings from a software perspective. So if the mere mention of networking still gives you chills down your spine, don't worry, I will provide a brief overview of these topics before we attempt to input any network configuration settings into the Windows 10 OS. First up is to define what an IP address is. IP stands for Internet Protocol and an IP address is a unique numerical identifier assigned to every device connected to a network. Within this definition, the keyword is assigned, as an IP address is logically assigned, can be changed, and even reassigned as needed. Currently, there are two versions of IP addresses in use. IPv4 and IPv6. IPv4, which stands for Internet Protocol version 4, is the older and more widely adopted version. An IPv4 address identifies a device in an Internet Protocol version 4, or an IPv4 network. It is worth noting that IPv4 addresses use a specific type of notation, called dot .decimal notation. Dot .decimal notation is a way of displaying a big number in manageable chunks. In the case of an IPv4 address, each address is 32 binary digits long. This is a bit difficult to understand. So let's group this 32 binary digit address into different containers that are separated by dots. This will create four sets of eight binary digits, also known as octets. Next we will convert each octet from binary to their decimal value equivalents, resulting in a dot decimal notation that is much easier to read. With this dot decimal notation, each octet can range from 0 to 255, providing us with over 4.2 billion numerical combinations. IPv6 addresses are considerably longer than an IPv4 address, at 128 binary digits long. IPv6 addresses also use a different addressing scheme. IPv6 addresses include eight groups of four hexadecimal digits, separated by colons. Each group of four hexadecimal digits can also be called a hex tet. Next, let's explore how IP addresses are assigned to devices. There are two main methods, static and dynamic. A static IP address is manually assigned to a device and remains constant over time. This is often used for servers, printers, or other devices that need a persistent, unchanging address in order to be consistently located by other devices. On the other hand, dynamic IP addresses are automatically assigned by a service called DHCP, which stands for Dynamic Host Configuration Protocol. With dynamic addressing using DHCP, a device receives an IP address from a DHCP server when it connects to the network. This dynamic addressing using DHCP allows for efficient assignment and use of IP addresses while also preventing addressing conflicts, where two or more devices are assigned the same IP address. Regardless of the method used, you won't be surfing the internet and visiting your favorite websites without the correct IP settings for your particular environment. A subnet mask is used to divide an IP network into smaller subnetworks, or subnets. The process of subnetting improves network performance and security by segmenting larger networks into smaller, more manageable subnets. This allows for better control of network traffic. Think of subnetting as creating VIP sections in your network club, keeping the crowds manageable and the party going smoothly. Now for many of you, this might be the first time hearing about subnets, and that is okay. You will definitely get an earful once you progress on to Network Plus. So for now, just have an idea of what a subnet is and what a subnet mask might look like. As for the binary math that goes with this topic, just leave that for later. A default gateway, in the context of a computer network, is a router or networking device that connects a local network to the internet or other networks. It acts as a doorway, allowing your computer or other network devices to send or receive data from outside the local network. The function of a default gateway is straightforward, yet vital. When a device on your network wants to access a website, stream a video, or download a file from the internet, it sends that request to the default gateway, as long as it knows where to find it. 
Next we have DNS, or Domain Name System, which is used for translating human-readable domain names, like domain.com, into IP addresses that computers can understand. When configuring DNS settings, you can specify primary and secondary DNS servers. The primary DNS server is queried first, and if it fails to respond, the secondary DNS server is used. Proper DNS configuration ensures that your network devices can resolve domain names and access internet resources efficiently. DNS is essential for web browsing, email, and any application that relies on domain name resolution. Think of DNS as the network's phone book, it helps your devices find each other without awkward introductions. Now that we got those pesky networking details out of the way, let's work through a possible real-life problem. Imagine a scenario where a user cannot access any web pages at all, but can ping the local host, the gateway, and known IP addresses on the internet and receive a response. This indicates that while the network connection itself is functioning, the DNS settings might be at fault. When the DNS is not working correctly, users may be able to reach websites by entering their IP addresses directly, but cannot resolve domain names to IP addresses, which is essential for accessing websites through URLs. Additionally, if a user selects a web search provider and a different website opens, it might indicate a redirect or a corrupt DNS record. So do you think you are ready to set up and configure a network adapter on a Windows device? I bet you are more ready than you think. But just to make sure, we can walk through it together. First, head over to Control Panel and click on the Network and Sharing Center. On the left side, click Change Adapter Settings. Next, right-click on the network adapter you want to configure, and select Properties. This will open up the Properties dialog box. There are many network settings that we can adjust here, but we will only concern ourselves with the Internet Protocol version 4, or IPv4 settings at this point in our journey. With that said, give that option a click. We will then be presented with a dialog box specific to our IPv4 settings. Now, let's take a closer look at this dialog box. This is essentially your control panel for configuring IP settings on a Windows client. Here's what you'll find and what each option means. IP address is where you enter the IP address you want to assign to the device interface. For example, you might enter 192.168.1.100 for a device on a local area network. The subnet mask helps define the IP address range of the network. When in doubt, just look for the 255. It's usually a dead giveaway. Default gateway will specify the IP address of your router, which acts as the gateway to other networks, including the internet. For instance, you might enter 192.168.1.1. Whatever you do enter, make sure it is the actual address of the default gateway, or you will be stranded in your local network. Preferred DNS server will be your primary DNS server. This server is used first to resolve domain names. Oftentimes, this will match your default gateway as many routers come with a built-in DNS server. The alternate DNS server will be your backup DNS server, which is used if the primary server is unavailable. Personally, I like to use Google's public DNS server, located at 8.8.8.8 as my alternate DNS server of choice. Now imagine you're setting up a small office network, with a mix of static and dynamic IP addresses. The office has a router serving as the default gateway, DNS server, and DHCP server, all in one, that is charged with assigning IP addresses dynamically to most devices. However, the office file server needs a static IP address for consistent access. To accomplish this, you would configure the file server with a static IP address, subnet mask, default gateway, and DNS settings to ensure it's always reachable at the same address. These settings can be viewed on the left. For the dynamic IP addresses, you would ensure that all other devices are set to obtain an IP address automatically from the DHCP server. This setup simplifies network management, as you don't need to manually assign IP addresses to every device. This also prevents IP conflicts with other DHCP assigned devices, and makes it easy to add or remove devices from the network. Keep in mind, it is still possible to have an IP address conflict between a statically assigned device and a dynamically assigned device in some situations. You could also end up with an APIPA address if you configure a device for dynamic assignment and the DHCP becomes unreachable. 
Those are the addresses that begin with 169.254. Thank you for watching. Subscribe for more great content.